So welcome everyone uh, to this amazing Ask Mentoring session with Ashwini Dalit, who is a senior manager of product quality at Digit. Uh, before I begin, a huge shout out to Brother Stack, who are our exclusive sponsor for all our uh, community events, the premier sponsor for all our conferences. Because of teams like Brother Stack, uh, we are able to do a lot of these community events pro bono uh, and educate testers from all over the world. With that, I would like to call Ashwini on stage. Uh, so, Ashwini, uh, before I call her on stage, rather, uh, let me just give a brief about her. Uh, she works in uh, Digite as senior manager product quality, and she helps team deliver bug free products. She has worked with a lot of teams to achieve right balance upstream and downstream, and bringing in work efficiency and more. She has roughly twenty two years of experience uh, uh, in, into testing, and while I was backstage with her. We realized that how testing has evolved since we started a long time back, and now the kind of skills it requires, and uh, how automation has become so mainstream, and hence her topic of today, optimizing uh, test automation maintenance, becomes so important. So, with that, let me welcome Ashwini on stage. Hi, Ashwini. Hi, Ashutosh. Hi, Ashwini. Uh, all good. All settled. All settled. Yeah. All settled. <laughs> good. Good. Uh, good. With that, Ashwini, let's jump in immediately to the question set we have. Okay. So test automation is, is is not new. Of course, it's it's gaining popularity. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of debate about automation versus manual uh, and stuff like that. But 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 people have been making a lot of mistakes when it comes to test automation. So, from your experience, what are the most common mistakes which people make when it comes to test automation? Right, it's a it's a great uh, question, Ashutosh, uh, because uh, most of the maintenance overhead that we get in yeah. test automation, uh, one of the primary factor is is our own coding mistakes in the test automation. So yeah. that is uh, one of the biggest reason. There are multiple different factors uh, which are commonly seen. Uh, many a times the wait strategy is not correctly implemented. Uh, yeah. There's an easy solution which everybody finds is uh, putting uh, thread dot sleep. So uh, what ends up happening is that you know that <coughs> not working on the screen. Quickly put uh, a time to wait and uh, then forget about removing it. Uh, if you Correct. put it for debugging and then you forget about it. But what ends up happening is that you have clogged one of the uh, thread and uh, uh, it is like, uh, 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 it will just uh, stop the test execution flow. But right. what is essential is to understand what is that proper visual clue uh, that needs to be investigated as to why that uh, uh, test automation is not working fine. So that is one. Uh, some other uh, errors or, or some other problems that I see uh, people making mistake is not layering the tests well. Okay. Uh, many a time the test script part of it and the, the automation code part of it is again mixed up. There's a lot of hard coding okay. that one does, like just putting the automation code and, and the uh, script level code. BDD okay. kind of mandates you to bring in that kind of a separation. Because okay. if uh, you maintain a sanitization in terms of what is the flow you're trying to test, and then in the test uh, step definition, you kind of put down your DSLs and maintain that separation of concern. So that way, it it always it will help you debug things properly as to what is the context in which uh, the automation has been done. Gotcha. Then. Uh, there are again uh, pretty much uh, not enabling the coding conventions. Uh, there are multiple coding mistakes which happen. Uh, you keep empty catches, which is like devilish, I, I feel. Because <laughs> you don't even get the kind of failing mechanism. I mean, you don't even get the trace of things uh, uh, by why automation is going to fail at a particular yeah. step. So uh, that is that is uh, other problem. Uh, one more important uh, problem that happens is that writing long running scripts. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, if if you keep a right tap at uh, uh, at the script, uh, like the amount of time a single script should run, or the kind of uh, test purpose for which you are writing a particular script, it has to be crisp. 
the moment you feel i don't want to create something new i want to keep on appending it to an existing scenario or an existing script correct correct, correct. you are actually developing a sequential pattern and it yeah. will not really take advan- advantage of parallelism the the second important point that will happen is that uh, uh, if it fails uh, you are left in a problem as to at what uh, context what stage did it fail nobody is going to remember a long story oh, and then God, yeah. you want to it fail somewhere uh, in between you are going to put a break point come to that state and then start Correct. debugging it further it it becomes pretty uh, problematic and you will keep avoiding such a failure and uh, not fix it because nobody uh, has so much of a background as to in what context it was written so uh, so lengthy so it misses the purpose of test automation i mean it has to be crisp it's it's an art you need to think about it apply all the coding conventions so not applying coding conventions properly is another big mistake that a team generally make one more point that comes to my mind is about uh, the data dependency uh, teams make mistake by developing uh, data dependent uh, scripts and again in 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 a parallelism kind of a scenario it becomes pretty conflicting wherein the test starts eating each other's data and uh, again uh, it creates kind of a random behavior So, so those are few things that comes top of my mind. No, these are very solid. Again, a lot of us might know all of them, might know some of them, but to just have being uh, reinforced uh, those scripts. And I think the point of writing longer codes in automation is similar to what we get taught in while we while we were kids, right? Writing essays, write shorter sentences so that you make less grammatical mm-hmm. mistakes. Exactly. right uh, that we were taught as uh, as as kids while we used to write essays and i think that's so valid in, in generally also and we we have a habit of writing a lot speaking speaking a lot and in general writing longer codes just to avoid that modularity and doing a, a short thing short cuts very valid points right uh, um okay this is question that i want to take from shubham again an audience question Okay. Again, uh, test failures will happen, and uh, will continue to happen, and it will affect maintenance. But what's the most, or what are the two, three ways of doing an analyzing test failures effectively in general? Right. So it's a it's a great question, uh, Shubham, uh, because many a times uh, uh, the super superficial analysis you quickly conclude that it must have been some random issue and that test just failed for some reason. without really going to the depths of it so uh, when you look at the failures there can be multiple reasons as to why a script might fail there may be genuine reason there may be non genuine reason uh, if you if you consider the genuine reason why scripts fail uh, it might fail because of a valid uh, application defect now these kind of failures are very easy to understand because you if you would have put an exact assertion and you come across a failure and so on so it's pretty clear and you can quickly find these kind of errors now uh, uh, an- another uh, good set of errors which we can very easily find are the errors uh, or or the or the failures where you know there is uh, you know that there is some change in the functionality or there is some uh, some uh, selector changes and you know that okay now uh, it's a failure it's a straightforward failure and it will incur some amount of script fixes but these are kind of uh, category of failures which are very straightforward and these are pertaining to the application under test now there are uh, there are non genuine failures wherein uh, which are uh, uh, which are difficult to debug many a times uh, we find them uh, that these are reproducible only in the uh, playback environment it doesn't reproduce on a, a testers machine and these are failures when you start looking at these kind of failures it it really becomes like a problem as to what would have gone wrong because most of the runs are like unattended runs and when you look at the logs you kind of uh, look at the failure and say okay uh, something went wrong during the nightly run but now everything looks hunky dory now these right. kind of failures really need good amount of uh, uh, analysis you have to look at logs very carefully uh, there may be reasons you need to look at the automation logs first. that's that's the first uh, thing i would suggest uh, automation logs 
if if the in the automation framework if you would have logged the information correctly you will see the failure logs like i said if you don't log traces if you don't uh, catch exceptions then this valuable piece of information is lost it will take you much longer to uh, dig deeper and find out <laughs> what step uh, the application actually uh, didn't get recognized or which step uh, failed further it's very easy to put a breakpoint and then say Ki, it's working very easily on my machine <laughs> Problem. But then uh, uh, every day you're going to get that failure because the random behavior is still in the playback environment and it's not there on your machine. So look at the uh, automation logs. The next thing would be to capture the application logs as well. Correlate your automation logs to the application logs. And see at the time when, when that particular behavior happened, in reality, was there a problem with the application? Was there a server slowness? Because when you run things in parallel, application might have a different behavioral context, which you don't get when you're trying to run a single script on your own machine. So I remember we uh, we used to collect access log, app logs, uh, and, and then correlate our automation failures to the kind of uh, uh, application failures that we would see uh, in, the, uh, in, in the playback environment. There may be other interferences as well. Like, for example, uh, there might be certain failures which crop up um, when uh, when uh, there are some browser updates that happen. And uh, some sometimes you, feel, you find that a particular browser version, a security patch comes, and some of the constructs start failing. Now, these are some things which are not under your control. Many times you try uh, doing a playback on your machine, the browser version on your machine and the playback environment may be different. So you need to be absolutely careful if a particular failure is not reproducible uh, in a particular uh, environment and it is reproducible in the playback environment. You have to do a much deeper level of investigation, correlate uh, various contexts which are available over there, and then uh, come uh, put additional logging, additional uh, mechanism to find out that is, can I make this failure repeatable? Can I get additional information? Additional that I information. Remove this failure. If it is a false alarm, I remove this failure from the night alarm. And if it is a genuine failure, I still need to reproduce that kind of application context. That it is in this particular context that application might still fail. It Our automation code is still catching a relevant bug, but it's just that we are not reading the failures correctly because we are not able to create that kind of an environment on our individual localized uh, laptops of your own machines. So those are like I think additional, very... additional uh, things also that, that can be uh, thought of. That was a very detailed answer. And I think Shubham, uh, it must have helped you in understanding and getting clarity of your question. Okay, this is again a very interesting question and more at a philosophical level, uh, okay? Uh, when I read this question, I thought this is, this is, this is a very philosophical level. Uh, this is from Ranish uh, from OLX, who is an SDET to at, at Gurgaon. I've experienced in past projects automating GUI, GUI flows. There's a lot of maintenance effort. We know it in general. GUI is a lot of maintenance. Locator changes, functionality changes, like element, elements, position change, text change. But changes that API level are easy to maintain. So is GUI level automation worth the effort also? Uh, who, uh, who asked this question? Uh, Ranish. Ranish, Ranish, it's a great question. Uh, uh, what is the importance of GUI level automation, and is it is it really important to do GUI level automation? Correct. I think I think is it worth the effort? Is it, at times it's important, yes, but it's important from the from an effort standpoint. That's the uh, mood question I think he's trying to address. Correct. So, uh, firstly, we need to understand that what should get automated in GUI. If you know that uh, the application is going to be used, it's a it's a, a GUI based application, and it's going to be used by the end user in and with the UI. Then definitely there has to be some amount of end to end test which should get automated with a functional test automation tool. But it is not necessary to automate each and everything with a functional test automation tool. I think uh, 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 what I have uh, seen with uh, most of the teams is that there's no separation of concern in terms of how they layer their tests. The fragility problem or the false alarm problem or long running suit problems really come up 
when this separation of concern is not taken care properly. Uh, if you know that uh, the test is uh, more uh, protocol centric in terms of information, then the right layer is the service layer automation that you should be doing. It's more of a business dependency between two components is what you're trying to test. Then that is basically very easily testable at the service layer. And you just remove the UI fragility at that point, the moment you implement a better service level mechanism. If you're testing something like, uh, which is more of a health check of a form, then these are very easily done on the client side unit testing using frameworks like Jest and Mocha. You should not be replicating form level validations in a uh, functional test automation tool like Selenium or any other uh, uh, proxy in injection tool. Because you're, you're setting up so much of a session data and the overall ecosystem of the application just to validate whether the form level validations are coming up correctly or not. So it doesn't, it doesn't make, it's not bang for the buck. When you're setting up a functional test automation repository, there's a hell lot of an investment in terms of actual dollars that you put. Firstly, you need I mean, to hold the application URL, which in itself is a, like a, a fully operational. If you have multiple microservices, uh, then it's like a end-to-end -end test and there's the entire ecosystem coming up. Then you have the playback uh, machinery where you have if you're running it in, in a parallel mode, there's uh, enough machinery you set up so that uh, the automation happens. So it has to be dealt very correctly to make sure that you are automating the right dependency check, which are like one hop, two hop scenarios, which should get automated in the end-to-end -end layer. And it should get automated because ultimately it's your end user who's going to look at the GUI to make sure that uh, these uh, interdependencies are working fine when they are integrated and in, in an environment, in a production-like environment. So it's essential there has to be end-to-end -end automation, but there has to be automation at different layers of the test pyramid with the tip of the pyramid being very small and, and the base of the pyramid having a right kind of mix of uh, UI units and the backend units. Uh, in fact, microservice layer uh, adds another, uh, just like the separation of concern when you build microservices, even the test automation repositories and end-to-end -end test for each of the microservices can be tested in isolation. And truly speaking, the end-to-end -end test, which comes when you have all the live dependencies becomes very thin. In, oh, if, the, if the testing happens in that manner, then the number of functional tests you end up developing are very small. And that way you just curtail down uh, the, the fragility element associated with the overall functional test automation also. Every other layer, uh, there's, there's no UI fragility aspect. You have exactly the test condition. And if it fails, it points you to the point of failure in the code. And plus it runs in seconds. And it doesn't need so much of setup in terms of the entire session data being there. You run on mocks, you run on static code or uh, static data sets, and the tests really run very fast. So it's essential that you do justice to each layer of the test pyramid and, and accordingly uh, uh, take care of uh, every aspect of testing. God, I think that was a very detailed answer and uh, very rare would you find somebody going into that detail of, of <laughs> of how uh, overall automation suit should be maintained and articulating it so well. That was a great answer, Ashwini. And Ranish, I hope uh, your, your question got answered. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to add in the uh, Q&A tab. Uh, we discussed about elemental locators and layer strategy. What are the, one of the factors of uh, which leads to a lot of automation maintenance is, is also environments, right? Yeah. Right, and uh, environments change while we do in-house, when we set up in-house machines to move to cloud migration on our local machines to let's say server side. So how do we handle environment issues effectively to optimize our test maintenance effort? Yeah, this is another, another uh, great question because many a times there are environmental factors, even if the automation code is running fine and it's the environment which adds uh, additional layer of concern because of which autom automation might fail and it can add to the uh, uh, testing cost or it, it can add to the failure analysis cost. Now, um, when when we, in good old days, when we used to have in-house environments, 
these machines were very easily accessible and it's a invested cost in terms of playback environments okay. even then there there used to be problems like uh, 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 machine are not behaving correctly when the playback is going on or there's some surprises where you have false alarms and automation not working fine so a uh, test environment definitely creates uh, some amount of distraction for clean playback to happen now you can avoid all these things if if these environments are uh, sanitized and maintained uh, correctly now this sanitization can be uh, like you there there are scheduled jobs uh, uh, like many a times you have antivirus updates and browser updates and os patches and suddenly you find that the playback is on and there's something that goes wrong and it actually hogs the network bandwidth and you don't realize that because at the, these are mostly the unattended runs and you look at the failure uh, report in uh, once you come back next day and you find that how come this something just just did not work correctly uh, <laughs> it's lack of cpu or lack of memory or lack of network bandwidth right. and uh, it cannot be even investigated because nobody goes down to machine level to see the event log as to th- what went wrong on the on the machine now uh, so that kind of sanitization is important and and one of the thing that we used to do in the, in the good old days when we had this uh, bare metal machine playback we every time we uh, hit upon an issue we used to add it to a checklist that okay so if i am getting a new environment which is going to be used for playback we need to make sure that all the other problems that we had uh, gone through in the past are corrected there's there's no antivirus running at that time there's no other updates going to happen the cpu is correct uh, the disk space is correct there has to be disk a uh, disk uh, alert if you if if it is 70% full there has to be an alert that playback cannot happen because the result folder will not get created so the multiple small little things in the periphery where automation is needed in terms of test environment so that you can have a clean playback now when we move from uh, bare metal machines to cloud it's another journey altogether this was still an invested cost so you could use the machine any number of times and correct, correct. you and can just add more machines and you can add, add more machines more, more machines and just take lab space Absolutely. add more machines now the moment you go to cloud uh, uh, it's like a, a prepaid postpaid plan and you know that you have to be uh, correctly utilizing the cloud hardware and every additional uh, dollar spent has to be utilized to find defects and not uh, fragility so we have to be careful when you are when when we make use of cloud infrastructure and similar kind of mechanism where you take the right image backups when you take those image backups you need to ensure that all my testing dependencies testing libraries are correctly uh, present on that ecosystem similarly if you if you are having application under test also in the cloud infra the network connectivity between the playback infrastructure and your application under test is properly maintained in a in a single vpc and so on then um uh if 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 at all there are uh, uh, libraries related to uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, you want a you want the exact display resolution or so or there are certain things you need on the on the machine that gets spawned then uh, all those dependencies also have to be added when when we move from uh, ec2 machines to eks there's another uh, another layer that gets added and uh, uh, when we when we do that we need to make sure all the cpu memory and the network configuration is correctly configured to make sure it it helps uh, the parallelism with which you are going to take the test automation run it might come as a surprise that uh, you start a 3 uh, 4 thread run and the cpu is entirely hogged and the automation playback fails so a right uh, configuration of uh, all the all the components because you're basically utilizing the host uh, uh, machine infra second thing a second uh, important thing when it comes to container playback is uh, mounting the drive uh, from from the host machine correctly so that you can persist uh, the the output logs these these machines get destroyed once the playback is over and uh, the logs will get lost uh, once once the playback ends so either you have a database connection Uh, so that you persist the results, or uh, uh, or you just take the log folder uh, before you destroy and put it on an S3 or some other drive. So it's 
So there has to be a mechanism where you persist the kind of data that gets collected. And it's also essential to collect the logs. So <laughs> one of the things that we have done is we, we, we have recently put our log information in uh, Prometheus and Grafana, where it is directly connected to uh, uh, the, the, the main Loki server and the data itself gets uh, backed up in, in the log server. So that way, you know that when, when the infrastructure is destroyed, I have all the logging mechanism at one place and I can correlate my application logs or the automation logs. And then it helps me debug at a faster pace. That's true. Thank you again. A great answer. Your answers are very technical yet so uh, understandable in that respect. Uh, this is a question from Parvez. And there are two related questions. I, I'll put both of them on display here. Okay, before you attempt answering. This is from Parvez, who is a test manager at VN, PNP Paripas, I think, from your city, Mumbai. How to keep automation up to speed with rapidly changing application in today's agile world, which is one question. Another related question from Ranish is similar. Uh, with most of the teams focusing on instant automation, which is like which is like the Achilles series we all are trying to solve for, right? Okay. It feels uh, sometimes you are rushing to automation, which leads to Rush script, rushed test script code merges of lower quality. And it's on how to counter this. So both questions related. Uh, how do we handle automation slash its maintenance at a faster pace? Yeah, these are these are really great questions. And uh, uh, it, it's like uh, feeling nostalgic about, yeah, there was a state that uh, we, we learned the hard way as to how we can really uh, curtail the maintenance cost which which come up with a rush our uh, release certification so uh, uh, what we have done is um, we can have a better upstream downstream strategy for test automation now what it means is that uh, in the value stream uh, when when you, when uh, when the user stories are getting groomed which is the upstream part of the sprint planning uh, at that point of time, uh, we basically get our tech leads, talk to uh, uh, test leads to find out automation impact of a user story. Because when they are like the, the upstream value stream itself is split into uh, various uh, columns, like uh, uh, you basically have to define a high level design, then NFR uh, impacts. At the same time, you also impact for whether there will be any uh, impact to existing automation inventory. And uh, if you have that kind of uh, impact, then you estimate for like how many APIs will get impacted. Let's say business APIs or automation keywords will get impacted if this kind of a change is brought in. Many a times user stories have uh, information about UI UX refactoring. These are very easy target to estimate for, estimate and anticipate that there is going to be uh, automation porting effort needed so that you can uh, shake hands with the developer, try and understand uh, that when this card is picked up for the next sprint, I am prepared that I'm going to keep aside time to fix the uh, porting of the automation. So during upstream, when you have this kind of uh, uh, collaboration between developer and tester, it definitely helps uh, correctly estimate for uh, test automation. Now, in the in the downstream, uh, when when you actually pick up cards for implementation, the development team would uh, start working on the code. Testing team will start automating it, right? So uh, during that, uh, one of the process that we do is uh, we ba basically ask the developer tester to discuss test cases. Now, when they discuss test cases, uh, uh, and this is prior to writing the first line of code. When they discuss the test cases, they basically tag every test case, whether at what layer it should get automated. There can be test cases which are, let's say you're developing one additional form in the application. There are uh, basic checks and balances for the form. Then uh, they will prescribe that these kind of checks and balances should be uh, built into the Jest layer or the Mocha layer on the client side. Uh, something can be just a configuration property if it is like a React kind of a UI or so. It doesn't really need automation. So when you have that kind of collaboration between the developer and tester, you can very well articulate in terms of how you can maintain a test pyramid at the user story level. 
with that you know and understand that okay i will need one or two end to end scenarios that may be within the context of this particular story or within the context of multiple stories taken together and okay. when you when you limit the functional test automation itself it will become manageable to be done within the context of the sprint and what is happening is these kind of discussions happen before even the implementation begins if you follow that kind of pattern it may not be 100% followed but let's say even if you follow it to 60 70% there's lot of uh, groundwork that you can start early enough in the sprint cycle so that you can carefully uh, keep uh, your own analysis ready as to when this kind of user story gets committed these are five apis that i'll have to refactor why uh, why not just start working on developers machine local url or so see how much is changing you can interact with them and tell them that if you don't if, if it is possible for you not change the selector just revamp the css it it will not uh, get my automation Uh, it will not uh, allow my automation to fail so when you collaborate uh, in 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 that fashion you can curtail down a lot of uh, to and fro that happens God, uh, yeah. where a lot of uh, uh, wastage can be really curtailed uh, and and automation uh, you will be able to complete at least 70 80% of functional test automation which is needed for the sprint interesting i think <clears throat> the collaboration point is really very which brings which brings my which brings me to my next question in general it's easier said than done right collaborations with developers there is a, there is a industry wide trend industry wide trend of a little friction between the two it works on my machine it doesn't work on my machine i don't know <laughs> memes keep flowing right there's yeah. always that <clears throat> that level of initial friction which say how do testers and developers collaborate in general uh, right and how so, do we and how do we because uh, if we because i have a hypothesis that each one of them is trying to optimize for themselves and yeah. how do we inculcate, inculcate a culture of that we are optimizing for for a common goal which could be product delivery on time so how do we inculcate that culture and how do we, how can we collaborate better absolutely uh, the overall <clears throat> so so in case of test automation or functional test automation primarily uh, uh, it it's i mean you need to put as much as effort which is needed for any other software development now if if there's a good level of collaboration between the developer and the tester i think uh, the amount of maintenance overhead and uh, like we discussed uh, for the previous question a lot of wastages can be avoided because ultimately uh, we are working to get the user stories uh, which are planned for the scope of the sprint ready for the production now if there's a high den seek which is going on that okay <laughs> i'm going to develop and then i'm not going to tell you anything about uh, you, yeah. and once my coding is done only then you can come to me and uh, i'll give it to you for testing then uh, uh, till the time the the developer uh, the, the tester reports something that certain things are not working the developer has already picked up another story and has to say that uh, okay i'm in the middle of some other detail oh, story yeah i don't have time to look at the problems you are telling and when the developer comes back and says okay show me reproduce the problem on my laptop or reproduce the problem on my machine then uh, then again there is a tussle that goes on i think if if there is a hide and seek game then nobody wins in such <laughs> a game. i think uh, it's essential for the tester equally uh to act as a facilitator you are not just doing uh manual testing or exploratory testing for a particular story or just doing the functional test automation for for that story but you need to take a holistic responsibility of building the test pyramid for the story it's like taking charge of the test strategy for a smaller piece in the overall uh, outcome that you're trying to achieve now when that kind of mindset change happens automatically the conversation improves from a different perspective it's not that i'm sitting here only to catch bugs for you but i'm trying to be a facilitator for you so that this story goes out to say staging without bugs less work for you in terms of debugging in latter environments yeah. so closer you are towards testing when it is locally on a developer's machine it's simpler to debug it's simpler to fix because the developer is still not uh, lost the context of information is still putting his own efforts in that story 
So I think if that kind of collaboration happens, it becomes equally beneficial for the tester because let's say you're developing automation for it and you collaborate well, you can develop your test automation. Uh, in fact, you can ask for help in terms of certain technicalities which might be needed. If at all certain things are failing, uh, you have to equally go to the developer to understand certain logs, correlate certain logs, and then you can find the information more easily. If it was always waterfallish, it's going to pile up. It's going to pile up. It's going to pile up. Even if we say we are doing agile and we have done sprint planning and we are doing user stories one after the other, it's always going to be a rushed situation the moment you come closer to the release deadline. Because most of the user, user stories are not tested. You have not done the test automation. You have kept it for the last day. Now everybody mm -hmm. tries to do automation on last two days. And automation, okay. you don't get time for automation because you get into bug finding cycles. The moment you get into bug finding cycles, even the developers get into bug fixing cycles. Bug so fixing cycles. There's no testing. There's no there's no focus to even exploratory testing. That's the true. focus is given to coding mistakes on both the sides, automation side as well as on the on the code side. Whereas coding mistakes are easy to avoid if you give right perspective in terms of uh, the initial discussion. Like uh, even if, if, whether you follow TDD, then it's the best. But if you don't follow TDD, at least have test case discussion prior to writing the first line of code. Correct. The moment you have those possibilities discussed within the context of the story, the kind of design you will come up with will have less bugs. You have the, the tester is there to think of all possibilities, how he can crack and make your story fail. He can give you enough conditions that that's what they have been trained always for. Yes, been trained always. Positive scenarios, negative scenarios, and, and yes. number of possibilities. But when you work from the context as to what can be various functional flows, what can be unit yeah. level positive, negative flows, and you are discussing it within a very small construct, only the construct of your user story, things are much more manageable. And, and it's not that you need to involve multiple different people. The moment you get into next environment, it's not just your own code. You're mixing it up with multiple different stories taken together. Absolutely. And the amount of time it takes to debug a failure is going to increase exponentially. So I think collaboration, when, when, when we talk about agile and we talk about trust. It's rooted in collaboration. collaboration a... we, talk, we talk just uh, <laughs> in terms of words. But when it comes Word, yeah. to following, uh, Practice, we don't really yeah. follow it. Uh, if that you start true. following what, what you uh, read about Agile or what you hear about Agile, it, it will change the way you start uh, you you start delivering those uh, user stories. That, that's true. And I think workplace conflict conflicts are natural. They will continue to happen. Whether it's between developer, tester, manager, subordinate, it will continue to happen. There is a time there is a, there is a mandate or there is an understanding of that we have to blend and not clash. It will it'll work yeah. well in general. That's the thing. We have a lot of questions coming in and we are lot, yeah, sorry, please go ahead. Just, just one point I thought of adding. And now, uh, apart from uh, just collaborating between dev test, I think one more aspect that we add, uh, we, uh, we have added in our value stream is also getting the user stories reviewed by the design team. Many a times it is very late in the in the feedback cycle that when you go for demos or uh, 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 before before the end of the sprint, you find that there are certain feedbacks which are given where you have to again go ahead and uh, revamp or revamp the UI side or again make some changes to it. Rather than delaying these things for the last, uh, when you say you do it left shift, it is basically within the context you know that you are more or less done with the user story and you have thought of uh, 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 getting a closure on it, it is that time you start testing. So it's, it's basically when you say continuous testing, you shift left to the extent possible that, OK, the, the code is ready, the, the design is ready. Now let the UI UX uh, uh, designer come and review your story there and then. Before you lose, uh, I mean, as a developer, you lose your context, you get those validations or you get those verifications done that the, the story has been correctly built uh, holistically so that you don't have to come back to it again and again once you get on to the next one.
got very interesting i think we have a few few more topics to cover and then i will take the elephant in the room also in the end which i have parked for the last okay uh, there are few more aspects to be covered one is about uh, this one this is a question from uh, from samir who's from virtuoso and i think if i am recording it the right virtuoso <clears throat> what are some of the aspects that automation tools are not doing right there are a lot of tools no code no code open source commercial lot of tools in the market which is again adding in my head adding a lot of confusion in, in testers at which one to use but let's assume uh, that we have found that out what are some of the as- aspects which you feel in general these tools are not able to address automation tools are not able to address okay yeah. so uh, i i'm guessing that the question is about the functional test automation tool and they are not you, able let's to- assume functional test automation for now for the sake of answering this question yeah 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 okay um i think uh, uh when when it comes to functional test automation tools so there are open source tools and uh, commercial tools in the market and uh, what is applicable to a particular organization or what is applicable to a particular team or a project it really depends upon uh, the kind of application they want to automate now uh, if and that is that is one part of it the second part of it is also i feel is uh, the skill level of the team over there uh, in terms of whether the teams are having dedicated uh, functional test automation teams or whether it's the developer uh, who has been given responsibility partly to develop the functional test automation suite whether they have the right kind of skill for doing that test automation when it comes to open source technologies there is some amount of learning curve where the team will have to understand and then uh, ensure they know to use the tool well when it comes to commercial tools uh, they get an advantage in terms of certain certain things that come out of the box in the in the commercial tools uh, where logging exception handling or or uh, the kind of uh, information that you get uh, as part of uh, uh the report in terms of whether you get a, a screen level a screenshot or you get screen level recording and so on uh becomes beneficial so uh, one has to really understand as to what they are looking for in terms of functional test automation when when they are trying to think of choosing a, a functional test automation tool there are multiple tools in the market uh, today and they have multiple different offerings and uh, and again there are budgetary concerns uh, around uh, like uh, how much up, up depending upon uh, uh, like skill budget and the kind of requirements that you may have one has to carefully choose uh, amongst all these different parameters but it is very essential that there are four or five things that one needs to really look at when when we talk about functional test automation with functional test automation there's always going to be maintenance associated with it correct even correct. if you say that uh, there are commercial tools uh, that give a lot of out of box functionality uh, fact of the matter is that application under test itself will evolve over a period of time and if you're looking at long term projects or uh, inventories which run for a larger lifetime there is going to be change in functionality there is going to be change in in ui and in order to accommodate that uh, what is the kind of uh, various uh, mechanisms that that the tool provide so that you can minimize the total uh, uh, minimize the maintenance associated with the tool now uh, there are tools in the market uh, which curtail it to certain extent they have uh, some amount of ai ml enablement and uh, there are uh, they have multiple different maturity of those ai ml algorithms also as to how much maintenance these tools can curtail it depends from uh, like uh, traditional tools would capture a single recognition string per element whereas a commercial tool may capture one or two or more or some additional parameters apart from just the dom elements or so but uh, it truly one needs to get an Uh, get to the details of uh, various tools when when you, when you try evaluating these tools and then look at the right balance to what you are trying to achieve from that uh, functional test automation tool you are trying to minimize the maintenance overload do you see that your application is going to evolve so much 
that you are going to need to curtail uh, maintenance or uh, it's like a smaller project uh, and once the project lifetime it's, it is delivered it's going to have much lesser changes to the ui the maintenance load is going to be minimal you, you can keep two members instead of uh, buying a tool and open source would be a good option so one has to really look at multiple checks and balances the skill level the tool capabilities uh, tool capabilities in terms of logging debugging uh, maintaining the object repositories maintaining uh, maintaining the script level information what is separation of uh, script and information versus the automation technical detail is it more readable not readable so there are multiple different factors one need to really understand as to what is that i'm looking for in a tool and what are my current pain points with re in relation to functional test automation that this tool is able to uh, really take care of and then make a wise call in terms of uh, skill budget and what the organization can go for no i think again uh... Very, very insightful answer. Uh, I have one more question on clean coding practices, but I think I'll have to park this for now for future when we interact next, uh, because this one is important. Uh, and this is again, everybody's asking this, right? Will AI with HQ automation tools affect our future? That's that's in everybody's mind that will chat GPT, generative AI, mid journey is going to take jobs of people. So what is your understanding? It's a I'm great- considering <laughs> and considering this is not related to the theme first of all but this is this is important for you to answer this question because you have seen this industry evolve over the last two decades or so from like we discussed backstage from qtp to to yeah, yeah. to uh, to, <laughs> to a lot of tools which i can't recall their names right now right <laughs> and and now we we're discussing grafana we're discussing reporting tools and a lot of stuff which has evolved so how do you see uh the future of all of us and how can we leverage these kind of ai based tools right i think uh, with advent of uh, ai ml uh, it's a it's a great uh, milestone uh, in the in the testing industry as well that uh, we are able to find out use cases where we have started incorporating uh, ai ml to really bring in the kind of efficiency much needed efficiency for for the testing domain and uh, uh it and in some places i see it's still emerging at a few other places i i find <coughs> that, uh teams have already started using it correct uh, and uh, they are trying they they are getting the benefit out of it but when when, when you really look at uh, uh whether it is going to harm the future of testing or whether it is going to uh reduce the job which, which which are basically the kind of questions i keep hearing as to yeah. what damage ai ml will do i don't think so uh, it will do any damage for the uh, testing community Correct. all that it will do is bring in efficiency and right focus that testing team was always needing uh the art and craft of testing is much different than kind of uh, work that testing team gets hands full with when when you uh, when you think about slipping deadlines when you think about releases not going on time and lot of uh, bugs going to and fro between uh, between the teams uh, we are basically trying to optimize processes and leakages that have happened in collaboration right. whereas uh, when you talk about ai and ml uh if the uh, if let's say if uh, ai ml takes care of the maintenance part of it like if at all uh, ui recognition strings change and ai ml is able to take care of uh, understanding that if uh, some aspect of ui ux is changed and it's still the same uh, component i'm interacting with it has removed removed the uh, the failure analysis effort so that that's a definite big plus that i see ai ml uh, adding to the automation maintenance part of it if ai ml can help develop test script in a much natural language then that, that is another big plus because test automation code becomes far more technical and not understandable to any other stakeholder uh, uh, within within the team it's only the testing team who can understand it end of the day so if if i'm able to write scripts using ai ml uh in much of a natural language and uh, and and uh, just trace the automation code to it 
ai ml would definitely uh, would have done uh, the much needed uh, bringing in of efficiency that way where where the scripts can still be shared with multiple stakeholders uh, if i see ai ml uh, advent of ai ml in the area of test generation also there are certain tools which are uh, uh, data generators or, or they 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 have uh, uh, connect uh, they are connected to large scale domain specific databases where they can generate uh, data static That's data right. for test automation so if you use right kind of apis uh, you can very quickly add the add these uh, apis to your test automation suite where you can give good static uh, uh, data feeds for the for the test automation which which otherwise a lot of time used to be spent thinking about what should be the first name what should be the last name what should be the mobile number <laughs> <laughs> data just, which you don't have we, to invest time into yeah and we just try to sanitize the data for half of our half of our lives right exactly half of our lives. and and ai ml would just give you that kind of data set that okay right. you need this kind of data set here here is a sample database and uh, it's available at fingertips there are there, there's ai ml advent in the area of understanding test gaps uh, uh where if if they can scan your repositories to find the code churn where exactly the code churn has happened correlated to a lot of analytics is involved in it of course may may not be ai ml but uh, just the data analytics just being, yeah just using if, the data in the right way this area you can very easily find out as to what part of the uh, what part of the code is not getting tested or there has to be an automation coverage in terms of any la layer of testing that can really build a good regression suit so there are multiple areas uh, of ai ml and are uh, trying to solve use cases in the in the area of testing domain i think the more it gets incorporated it will bring in the efficiency, efficiency. and the right kind of focus which is more domain centric focus of testing teams and which are much more left shift earlier the better that the testing team provide their inputs into various different uh, uh phases like where you are ba brainstorming the user stories where you are still thinking of uh, what are scenarios what are business usage patterns and you are giving the inputs over there these are far more important so that uh, the user stories are much more realistic they map to the business outcome and and it will eventually really get the the release output much more refined that kind of focus is lost when when the when the testing teams large part of bandwidth is spent only in finding and reporting uh, very superficial failures which don't contribute to uh, contribute really to the to the outgoing release that that's very true and i think uh, like somebody mentioned in the chat this is the first time when somebody has taken a different route of addressing ai ml in as like like either people are in denial okay hmm. this is not going to do anything manual is easier to stay and stuff like that and some are fear mongering in general okay that okay no you have to learn this will take away your jobs this will, this will eat your jobs only carpenters will stay only these will people will stay this kind of <laughs> this stuff is coming up but this is the first time somebody has taken a given a take on like it can be used in the most possible the best possible way for efficiency to drive in efficiency to increase efficiency and right? i think that's a very valid point now but uh, i am really amazed by the depth of and actually i can't thank you enough for